And welcome in to Poke the Bear, episode 61. That would be Rick Nash. That would be Milan Lucic. The retro the Milan Lucic. Yes, that's OG Milan Lucic. Well, OG Lucic would be like with the Bruins, but like retro Lucic, I guess, would yes. be really, uh, you know, that would be... The one numbers. where you get, you get the, you know, you, you get the peer pressure walking into the guy, and so you buy like the the jersey, even though you know, like, it's not gonna, it's, his number's gonna change, it's not gonna be a bootleg number, like, 61 next year, but you buy it anyway. It's like when, like, Jacoby Ellsbury was, like, 46, like, you have a good mm. 46, or, you know, one of those ones like that, so I think maybe retro is the right way to term that. Was Lucic's first, was it one of his first games he beat the hell out of some guy, was it Artukin from the Lightning, was that one of his first fights? That sounds uh, familiar. I, I think it was, I think it was. He had a big fight in, like, his for one of his first games and every Bruins fan for the next 20 years was like, every player must do that yes. in their first few games. A hat trick. Um, no, get out of here. No. Yeah. No, everyone, no. anyone can score a hat trick. Oh, there are still people who think like, Oh, Trent Frederick's a face of the Bruins just from that fight against uh, Brandon Tanev uh, and his first game. Anyways, I'm Evan Marinovsky. That's Connor Ryan. Connor, what is up? Evan doing well. How you doing? I'm doing great. I am doing just fantastic. And uh, the season is, or the the pre, right, the pre preseason is underway. There's been rookie camp, and that's what kind of we're going to focus today on, and and tempering some expectations, setting some realistic expectations, which never seems to really happen with younger <laughs> guys. No. Never really seems to take shape. Everyone's always, you know, it's it's the guys either going to be, you know, the next Bobby Orr, the next Ovechkin, or the next, you know, Neil Yakupov. This guy's going to suck. This guy's Zach awful. Hamill. Jordan Karan. Yes, we can get, the list can go on and on, especially with Bruins players. Um, but we'll start with uh, the man of the week. And that would be Fabian Lysel because we're getting the first look at Lysel in black and gold at Warrior. Uh, obviously, people are excited. And Lysel is very, very good. However, <laughs> it does happen sometimes when there are highlights tweeted out. And immediately people go, oh, look how good he is. See, look how good he is. But you've seen him in person now. What would you say are realistic expectations for Fabian Lysel? I mean, when you watch him on the ice, the talent's evident, right? I mean, he's what you expect in terms of his speed, uh, you know, his ability to create, you know, in tight and grade A ice. Um, extremely talented player. But I think maybe the one thing that stuck out, Send out to me, there was a drill where he was kind of at the net front battling with Nick Wolf, who uh, I believe Fabian Lysel is 5'10", 5'11", 170 pounds. And Nick Wolf is a big boy. Nick Wolf is 6'5", 225, maybe. Big defenseman. It went about, as well as, you, went about as well as you'd expect. Like, uh, he got knocked out of the, uh, the great ice very quickly, wasn't able to get much of a chance going. And that's kind of reminiscence of maybe what you saw last year from a guy like Jack Sneak up at the NHL level, where uh, as talented as Jack Sneak is, if you don't have that frame and the ability to battle inside, you're going to get pushed out of that great AI ice pretty easily. And that's not to say that Fabian Lysel is going right to the NHL or anything like that. But I think you have to be realistic with the fact that this is still a guy who turned 18 years old back in January. Uh, he's 170 pounds soaking wet. Um, as, as talented as he is, you have to expect there's going to be bumps along the road, along with the fact that even if he was, let's say 21, 22, there's a pretty major adjustment going from Sweden and those bigger rings over in Europe to the North American game, which is a lot, you know, you have less space to work with, uh, which hurts a guy like him. Who's a very skill-based guy. Um, got to add more details to your game, a two-way game. So it's to be expected that he's going to hit some bumps along the road. So I, I, I don't want to like just label him as being like, all right, expect him to like suck his first year expect him like the numbers to be you know if his let's say he plays like 40 games of somewhere and he has like 29 points if you're expecting like 82 points like you know a two points per game kind of guy you have to temper your expectations and who knows how he adjusts to this next level like he could go to the the prospects challenge in buffalo and score you know three, four goals and put himself on the track to, you know, land a spot in Providence, which I think would be maybe a little bit of a head of schedule, but it'd be very encouraging to see, obviously. But I think for Bruins fans where you look at a guy like Lysel and I think the, the one name you hear quite a lot in terms of getting parallels to his career is like a guy like David Pasternak, who went from great. The, yeah. Yeah. Went from the SHL, uh, came over here to North America. You expected a, a, you know, a learning curve really wasn't, was almost, I think a point per game guy in Providence, got bumped up to the NHL at 18, the rest is history. Like, 
very, very unfair to put that kind of expectation on Fabian Lysel with arguably the best goal scorer in the league, a guy who, I mean, how many teams are kicking themselves and not taking him when you saw how quickly his development curve was. So I think for Bruins fans, even if Lysel starts this upcoming year in the WHL and he plays in Vancouver, that's, you know, any any reps, especially considering how tough the last few years have been for prospects, is a step in the right direction. So let's say he goes to the WHL and, you know, he piles on points playing against guys his age. That's a great st- – that's a step in the right direction. If he makes that jump up to Providence, that's great. The numbers probably won't be as flashy as they are in the WHL, but he's learning on the fly as an 18-year-old. So whichever step he takes, it's a, a positive one. But I think just for Bruins fans, it's – when it comes to these prospects, you know, you can't expect a David Posternick every time you have an uber skilled guy added to the pipeline. And it's most, it's mostly just about preaching patience, right? It's about having, uh, having a player and having, you know, rolling with the punches as they go through development. Cause I mean, how many times look at, let's say a guy like Arho Vakanainen, who you looked at maybe 2017, 2018, you're like, all right, this guy by 2019, he's going to be a top four fixture. Like it doesn't work out that way, you know, whether it's injuries or, you know, hitting, hitting a wall at some point or other factors going to it, a lot can change over the span of a guy's development. So patience has to be preached for a guy like Lysel, but that being said, you should still be very excited about what he brings to this pipeline as a whole. You said the word patience. He's 18. Again, like we can't be expecting. I mean, remember Rasmus Delin. I mean, I know it's kind of comparing different things, but Rasmus Delin comes into the league at around, I believe, 18 with the Sabres. Now, granted, he's up in Buffalo, but he's a guy who's taken some more time, you know, than most people think or most people thought to sort of acclimate to the league. You have to expect that with Lysel. Um, and don't immediately think that he's, you know, untradeable or anything. But you might have an asset there to trade. If you really were going for a big gun, maybe you have something there. And that's something we can discuss when that, you know, avenue opens. Inevitable, also, inevitable storyline pops up. Yes. I mean, you don't want to be doing like a Philip Forsberg type trade for like Martin Erat. You know, you don't want to be trading, you know, uh, you know, Fabian Lysel for, you know, some jabroni second line right winger or something. You know, you want to Peter Solarik when he signed when he signs with a team from the KHL and comes back over here. Yes, exactly. So temper the expectations with Lysel a little bit, but enjoy the highlights. Enjoy the highlights because I, I guarantee be many. you there will be quite a few this year, uh, wherever he ends up, whether that be the WHL, Providence, Boston. Um another guy who another uh winger in the pipeline for the Bruins who the Bruins expect a good amount of is Jacob Lauko. Um who's had uh, who, who, uh, head coach, um, the head coach down in Providence, Ryan, um, Ryan Mujanel. Uh, Mujanel. I knew it sounded like Muzzarell. I could, I totally <laughs> messed that up. Uh, that's definitely gonna get clipped and put on, uh, Twitter. I guarantee it. Um, Ryan Mujanel comes out. Someone's gonna, the, you know, someone's gonna like, it's gonna be like Petrov or Spokes. He's gonna like superimpose him outside Satrials now. Yes. 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 No, I, I, notice I, of, I notice myself. of, notice of Brian <laughs> Ryan Mujanel. I set myself up for that one. I just started watching The Sopranos, by the way. I know people are like, "Oh, you're so late." I t- I, I have started though. I've officially started, and I like there you it. Go. So, uh, but I can't I can't make like jokes about it till the end of like season one. I feel like I can't like I can't be part of the club. Time. Yeah, I gotta give it. Yeah, some you gotta time. build. You gotta build up the catalog, right? You can't just skip ahead. So I find oh, yeah. memes from like season four. You gotta wait. Yeah, I gotta. I gotta give the it process. Some time. again. Patience. 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 I'm like Fabian Lysel with the Sopranos. Um, we got way off topic. Jacob Lauco, though, is uh, uh, Ryan Mujanel says push could push for a roster spot in the NHL. Uh, this is a guy who's fast, really fast guy. Um, do you see a chance that he makes the roster this year or at least out of camp? I mean, out of camp, I think it's a really tall ask. I think it's for most of these young prospects and it's tough to like, you know, there's no vacancies really that would open up a spot for him, especially like what the Bruins did in the off season. Right. Unless Lauko has a crazy preseason, like he looks fantastic at camp and, you know, scores a couple of goals in the preseason and outworks other guys. But even then I don't see him out of camp, especially out, you know, leapfrogging a, a Felino, a Nosek, uh, a Howla. Like I don't see him doing that. I don't see him leapfrogging the Brosk unless something is going drastically wrong. Like maybe like if he, cuts in on the fourth line and maybe he replaces a guy like Frederick if he's struggling, because I do think as much as people look at Lauko and his, you know, straight line speed, I still think probably the NHL he's best utilized as being like a very effective, like third line player. Like I look at him almost like a, uh, like a, like a lesser, like Coleman or even like a, like a Barclay Goudreau, like good speed, 
will fight in great AIs as an agitator and can be very, very effective in that role, which people maybe may not want to hear that, but I think for what his role could be, he could be very effective in a spot like that. But where he is on the, the depth chart right now, uh, it's kind of tough to like chart out an actual good spot where, where he would land. And um, it, it, it's one of those things too, where again, we preach patience. I mean, as solid as he was last year, I imagine the Bruins want to give him a little bit more of a look down in, in Providence for a full season because whether it be injuries or COVID, he's actually only played, I think, 44 total games down in the AHL in his career, which is I kind of surprised when I first looked that up. Like He could definitely use more of a, a normal season, too. Like As much as I think you have to be encouraged by guys like Lauko and Brady Lyle and Jack Ashan and these guys who like took big steps forward last year in Providence – Last year seems like it was such a bizarre season where it's like you're playing games in Marlboro. You're playing like one of three teams. Like I think they would they play like Bridgeport and like Hotford like almost every other day. Yeah, like, so it was the same teams. Yeah, like I think even if it's for a month or two, just having him go through the the rigors of a, a normal AHL season with normal travel, different opponents. You know, you're not seeing the same goalie every other weekend. Like I think. I'm not saying that completely stunted the development of these guys, but I think you want to see how these guys fare under a more normal schedule. And for a guy like Lauko, who I, I think it's again, best case scenario is he runs with the opportunity as most likely a top six guy down in Providence. He pots some goals, a point per game guy, and then maybe, maybe he makes a push. And again, it's going to come down to, I think how the, the pieces fall up at the NHL level, because I think Lauko's best spot is landing in somewhere in that bottom six, but with the Bruins kind of going to the free agency route to shore up so many vacancies there, it does make it tougher for a guy like him and for many guys. Like you've got as much as there's guys further down the pipeline, like a Lysel or a Mason Lori or beach or guys in college, you've got a lot of these guys who are either, you know, seasoned AHL guys or guys on the cusp who are probably looking at the depth chart. Like, all right, where exactly do I fit? Right. Like look at him or Cameron Hughes, Oscar Steen. Like there's a lot of those guys kind of in that, that kind of no man's land where it's going to be kind of incumbent on them to, to break through and try to leapfrog some established guys, which is a, a big ask to ask, you know, these younger players who haven't really carved out a spot like that before. But again, the Bruins preach internal competition. Uh, so we'll see kind of what comes out of it and who knows what happens in camp. Like we very well could be looking at Lauko two and a half weeks from now. And he's got a hat trick and a, a two point, you know, a three point game in his first two games of the preseason. And we're looking at it all differently of, Maybe he is in place of a guy like Frederick or, or a spot like that. So a lot can change, but I, I would say probably the safe bet right now is he opens the air in Providence and continues to kind of raise that stock that he's, I mean, it seems like every year he's taking a big step forward. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned it. There's a lot of bottom six forwards in the system. Do you know what there isn't a lot of? What's top that, six Evan? forwards in the oh, system. Yeah. And I think, and we've discussed this at length, but you're right. I mean, you have Cameron Hughes, Oscar Steen, Jacob Lauko, Trent Frederick. You can go down the list. You just signed a ton of bottom six forwards as well. Thomas Nosek and, and Eric Halla and Nick Felino. And that's great. Like you have depth there and that's awesome. But like, how many of these guys are you going to use? How many are you going to need? How many can even make the roster? Um, I think Lauko is one of these guys. I do think Lauko is a little more offensive upside to him than, than maybe, you know, the, the yeah. other guys that you mentioned. Um, but even then, I mean, do you, you know, on a, team contending for a cup do you want Jacob Lauko as your second line left winger no uh, he's young he's inexperienced and I don't know if he fits on the third line either unless Jake DeBrusque really 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 falls off um all that stuff is kind of unsafe bets uh okay in other news uh the Arizona Coyotes have come in and sweeped up John Ferguson from the Bruins grasp and hired him as the assistant general manager in Arizona uh Ferguson was a big player for the Bruins in terms of player development. He was the GM of the Providence Bruins for the past, I think, five years. Um, mm-hmm. I believe so. So a uh, pretty big loss to the player development system. I mean, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, good. Now they can get some new people who can sh- show some better players. But yeah, there were some hits in there. You know, there were some good guys uh, developed by him. Um, how much of a loss is this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's significant in terms of having an established guy in there. And as much as you could probably make the argument, it offers maybe potential for a new you know, voice to be in the room. Uh, he was still a very trusted part of the Bruins front office uh, and was a key advisor to Sweeney and the rest of kind of the moves they made, not just, you know, at the NHL level with trades and signings and what have you, but also down to the development level. He was very active in that role. So whether that's 
identifying guys to draft or you're looking at, uh, you know, it's well established that Bruins have very have been very active out on the college free agent front. So whether it's a guy like Jack Hashan or, or Connor Clifton, who's become a, a solid piece on the NHL roster, he's been very active in that role as well. So it's definitely a, a pretty significant loss in terms of just having a key guy in the room who's obviously – you know, been affiliated with multiple NHL teams and multiple front offices over the years. So um, again, with change comes opportunity. So we'll see how the Bruins kind of fill in that role and, and you know, how maybe the, the shift happens in terms of, you know, whether it be drafting or signing or stuff like that. I mean, I think we saw our first somewhat, you know, major shift in terms of the draft this year, where they finally took a, a player out of the CHL for the first time in like four, four years, I think. So like you, you saw some of that already, uh, going into this season, but it's been a pretty uh, interesting off season from just a management perspective in terms of the amount of overhaul there's been, whether it's, you know, Ferguson or Pandolfo going to BU or obviously Jay Leach going to, um, going to Seattle. So it's mm-hmm. as much as you've had, uh, you know, the key cogs kind of still in place there, there has been quite a bit of upheaval around other foundations in terms of either coaching or decision-making in terms of kind of the top brass. I'm most against the Jay Leach leaving because if Jay Leach hadn't left, I wouldn't have messed up the Providence Bruins head coach's last name. It wouldn't have happened. Um, but yes, I agree. I think it's it's a big loss. Uh, kudos to Ferguson, though, going out to Arizona. It's nice and warm out there. He'll get uh, winter feeling like summer. Might not be as fun uh, handling that team right now. That's no. a full-on full rebuild. Although they will have plenty of draft picks coming in over the yes. next couple of years. So yes, he'll get to develop. That. Yeah, he'll get to develop and identify talent uh, as much as anybody in the world. Um, another thing out of uh, rookie camp and these captain's practices is Jack Stanika is appearing to, is appeared to have bulked up. Mark Diver reported it over the summer from Foxborough. I know all you reporters that have been there have said he looks a lot bigger uh, and a little bit better, which is huge. I, I think that's actually a really big thing because – this is a guy who that's kind of been his issue. His issue has been staying in the lineup, and that's partially come from not being big enough. And now that he is a little bit bigger, but I also said this during the off season, I've expected so much out of Stanika or enough, you know, I've expected him to make the roster and stay there the past two years. So I'm kind of done with like projecting that he's going to be in the lineup. Like when he makes it, he makes it, but I'm done with being like, Oh, this is, this is the year that Stanika, you know, makes the lineup. How important though, do you think, uh, or significant is this weight gain? Yeah, I mean, it's always important to, I think, temper expectations when it comes to, like, we're at the, the nutty part of the preseason and the start of training camp where everyone's in the best shape of their lives or guys are showing up yoked and you're like, oh, man, here we go. Here, like, David here back goes. a few years ago with the sta- skating coach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think you have to take some of it with a grain of salt because whether it be, obviously, you've got veterans like yeah, David Backus who, after that you know 2018-19 season, showed up, like, dropped a ton of weight worked with a, a skating coach in the off season to get, you know, a lot lighter and, and kind of mesh with today's NHL didn't really work out, you know, like as much as, you know, it's always notable when you have a guy come in after the off season on whether they put on weight or lost weight, doesn't always work out. Look at like CC's bath. Remember when CC's bath, got like skinny and he had like a, like a 70 RA, like doesn't <laughs> always work out. Now, granted, we're talking about a younger prospect like Jackson Nico, where, it's pretty much a requirement or a hurdle that all these guys deal with is when they get to the NHL, they have to bulk up, put on, you know, healthy weight and learn to kind of get inside and get those great A scoring chances. And Keyword healthy weight. Yes. Healthy <laughs> weight. Um, but you, you look at kind of the way he plays and I think there's, you have to be encouraged by one, the, the work he's done this offseason, not just the fact that you could say that, you know, he could have gone back up to, you know, his home up in Canada and put in the work there too, but he pretty much stayed around Foxborough and in Massachusetts for most of the off season. So he obviously, obviously was very committed to that spot. Uh, clearly last season did not go according to plan. I think you look at him, as you said, this year, I think it's tough to map out exact spot as opposed to last year where you're like, all right, Jackson, has got a pretty solid chance of, you know, maybe carving out a spot here. You know what? He'll probably start on the wing, but starts there, you know, gets comfortable and, Next year when David Krejci, let's say he leaves or, or the Bruins don't re-sign him, you've, you've got Jack Sanika there ready to slot in a 2C. Did not work out that way. Last year was a pretty tough year for Jack Sanika, so obviously it seems like he's taken that to hot. Now, again, as you know, it's easy to notice it. Ryan Mugenel even said, like, it's noticeable looking at Jack Sanika, how much, you know, bulk, you know, he's put on. But we'll see how it translates to actual game settings because – 
I don't think you're going to get a full barometer in terms of his development and what you can kind of expect out of him until we had to preseason games against other opponents, because I think the Bruins have been encouraged. Like even when he, you know, first kind of got called up to the NHL, I think in 2019 or early 2020, um, a lot of what Bruce Cassidy and all the players said is that even though he clearly needed to put on weight, then he didn't really show any fear of, you know, fighting down low and getting those great eight chances. And even if you're not, getting a puck on net if you're at the very least bringing the puck down to that area of the ice get a rebound a tip you know usually good things happen if you do that so a year later if he has put on the weight and he's not only able to bring the puck down there but is able to you know control the puck and be able to influence chances and generate chances could lead to some good things now again uh i'm not saying that he's gonna leapfrog coil you know in training camp and jackson is going to be a revelation I and mean, we've got a, another 60 point guy here right like crazy things have happened but i don't think we have like a brighton point on our hands right like who, who knows what exactly could happen he could have a good preseason and then starts the year you know with a spot on the third line and plays nine minutes and we're back at square one right like that, that's how it is right so it, it's promising that i think he's put in the work over this off season and uh, I'm curious to see how that translates to his game because I still think even though he's bulked up, it's not like he's you know, like Nick, he's not like Nick Ritchie out there. He's not like a power forward now, right? Like he's not just like scrapping down low. But if he's able to at least you know hold onto the puck a bit more when he goes to the great A ice, um, good things should happen. So again, it, he's kind of in the same spot as a lot of these other younger players where there's not a defined avenue for him to just logically you know get promoted up to the NHL ranks and stay up there, but. Um, He's going to do himself a lot of favors if he has a strong camp and the work that he's put in so far this offseason seems to translate to the fact that he could be an impact guy, at least in these preseason games. Well, you mentioned him having no fear of going to dirty areas and great AI. Remember, was it the preseason of 2019 when he took the puck off the teeth? And yeah. Went in? Yep. He scored a goal off his teeth. So, yeah, he, he sh- it's never been like, oh, Sanuka shies away from the, the dirty areas. It's more like just gets kind of pushed around in yeah. there a little bit. Um, I think when it comes to preseason players to watch in the games, I think Stadnika is probably number one. Um, he's right in the top. I mean, that's a guy who, like, it's time to develop here. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's getting to be that point. So um, definitely encouraging news on Stadnika. I mean, all signs point to him being better. I just wonder if he can stay um, in the NHL because that's sort of been uh, his issue. That's everything today. That's everything for Poke the Bear episode 61. Uh, it's Connor. Before we head out, uh, what can the people look forward to over at BSJ? Yeah, we're going to uh, be breaking down the performance of some of these prospects and totally, uh, you know, not temper expectations probably once we see how they play against other opponents up in the prospects challenge up in Buffalo. So we'll have all the takeaways, reactions to that tournament. And then we have training camp right around the corner next week. So we'll have... Uh, Plenty of breakdowns, looking at training camp battles, as you said, guys to watch for once the preseason games get underway. All that stuff over at BSJ. So subscribe at bostonsportsjournal.com. You want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Got to get the tweets back up. Got to get those memes going. Yeah, the memes, the the, the mind is turning. The mind is turning. The wheels are are going. Anyways, that is Poke the Bear episode 61. Connor Ryan, Evan Marinovsky, Poke the Bear listeners. Have a great rest of your day.